many of you all have had firsthand experiences in public service. Uh, for those of us as elected officials, I certainly can speak for myself. I almost feel like after nearly 25 years that, that my life, my journey is one of public uh, service. And our panelists today bring a real broad perspective in that some of them have direct experience with uh, policymakers. Some come from the nonprofit sector, but all of their experiences, I would say, work hand in hand to further advance the quality of life for the citizens of our community, which is what public service is about. And so I'm going to start out uh, with Dr. Gilmore, who uh, certainly has worked in a number of political uh, campaigns. We won't name any candidates today because sometimes people are like thumbs up, thumbs down, depending on the candidate. All well, my favorites are here today, though. Okay. <laughs> smart man. Smart man, right? Smart man. Smart man. Smart man. Smart man. So, um, um, Dr. Gilmore, what do you think is the, the perception, if you will, of public service today from our community? Okay, <clears throat> very good question. And, um, and a lot of my research has been on political engagement and why citizens engage and why they don't engage in public service or politics. And I think that the president that we have right now, Barack Obama, President Obama, has reignited um, uh, citizens to become more engaged in politics. However, prior to President Obama and right now, we have citizens are, are still have a bit of distrust for government. Citizens still feel as if government officials are not addressing all of their needs. And so we have to really motivate one another and we have to really not allow our distrust in a governor or our distrust in a mayor or our distrust in the fact that I had to wait in line for two hours to receive food stamps or any type of government benefit give us a bad perception about government and our elected officials. We have to continue to work through those, but most research shows prior to, before President Obama, um, um, folks who had a very um, um, distrusting attitude towards government and elected officials. However, we hope that turns upward. So, uh, you believe that people have had As individuals, we all want government to take care of us. You know, and I, I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, you know, when a hurricane hits, you just want some assistance. Mm -hmm. Or when there's a tornado, you just want some assistance. And so what happens is the expectation is high that, you know, and I can say, I elected you, give me some assistance. I elected you, fix my home. And so and what happens when, when, citizens, when elected officials or government can't meet that demand, then citizens feel angst. They do get angry. Monica, you uh, work for an entity, a nonprofit that advocates for fair uh, housing, and so you have uh, had a in, uh, very intimate involvement with uh, some elected officials in advocating for fair housing. Uh, what has been your experience working with the constituents that you serve and their perception of those to owning businesses, we as parents 
think it's important, though, that we acknowledge that the sense of certain the support that used to exist for our young people are no longer there. As we talk about the institution of government, then indeed we've got to talk about, well, did we share with our youth the value of it? Let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's be genuine and authentic. If you don't have social, emotional, academic, ethical skills because you weren't nurtured, why indeed would we expect people to understand the institution of government? So somehow within the church, within the community, within the family, within every circle they walk into, there's got to be someone talking about the following. I'm sorry, I'm real basic. We can kick the academic side back, but that does help us. Being, learning, doing. That's the level of mastery of being a decent citizen and human being. And we don't spend enough time there. That's why I've gone from corporate America, Ivy League education, to teaching karate. I've got people in corporate, why did you leave? You were traveling around the world because it's not working. Look in the heart of North Philadelphia, looking on Plank Road. We can't talk government or religion or anything if we don't talk about building young people. I can't fix a broken man. No, Come on. I say it again. <laughs> Being, learning, doing. When you do that, and you learn that in a karate dojo, Come on. otherwise you get punched in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
And I think that um, all of us know stories that are captured in that listen to the violence. We all know um, that the beginning hurt upon hurt. I mean, that's, that's what's calling you into ministry because you have compassion and you know suffering upon suffering, fear upon fear, hurt upon hurt, anger, sadness. And sometimes all we can do is to be present with those who are in pain. Just listen to their story. The gift that we are. You know, we, are we embody God's love and we are present. And there's, there's a lot that we will not understand on this side of the grave. We just don't know why people can do certain things to each other. We just don't understand. We do understand violence doesn't pay, but we don't understand what causes someone to do this destruction to another person. We, 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 don't, we don't get it. But we can be together <laughs> and say there's things we don't understand, but we're together moving forward. We don't understand the 9-11. We, you know, we don't understand Oklahoma City, how a Christian can go in and do that. There's, I mean, there's a lot we don't get. And there's times that we have to find, you know, we just offer ourselves in prayer. Just simply, you know, God's grace, show me the way. And and we have to let go. And actually, as we let go, our hand is available. And again, you know, the speaker, Reverend Brenda um, Smith was our keynote speaker. And she said, you know, maybe the first thing we have to do is say hi. And she said, what would have happened if George Zimmerman would have rolled down his window and said, hello. You know, you need a ride? Uh, you need help? What would happen if we would say hello? You know, and then actually listen to what's going on here. So this bond, this waiting Um, and I'm just, have you ever been in that kind of thing where you just sort of stay up trying to catch up what God's open the doors? Every possible block, green light, green light, green light. And so I think that this is meant to be a gift to this community, this way we teach. So what we've done is, um, we, well, we, uh, we have created, here's a CD. I did not know one of the past presidents of the Federation has like a record company here in town, and so he helps make it look really professional, okay? I, that's what I mean, these doors keep opening. The, the people, it's like, how, I didn't even know what you put on the back of it to, you know, we have to get credit. What's the P? I'm like, what's my role? Who am I? Well, I'm an executive producer, I found out. It's like, oh, okay, that's whatever that is. Um, but uh, we are selling these, it's one for 15, two for 25, and 10 for each CD of three or more. And if any of you want one of these for $10, we simply want to get it out. You know, if you would want to give it to your Sunday school staff or to your colleagues, I mean, that's what, it's a gift. And then what we did is um, come up with curriculum so we could use this um, as a learning tool. So if you look at, um, there's a page that hopefully you take up five approaches to leading a discussion. Did you all pick up these pages? So basically what I'm going to do with folks is go over a lot of stats on politics and then talk about how you can be engaged in politics. Well, you're already there because you ran for office. Yeah. So that's the biggest, I mean, that's the highest level of political engagement. If you're willing to put up money, if you're willing to take, you know, take off the of work and, right. and every evening go campaign, you're you're in that in that that unique group of people that really, really believes in American democracy. Right. You really, really believe in exercising your rights that were, you know, given to you by the Constitution. Right. And you know, and you got different levels of political participation. I'm sure you know about this. You got folks who do nothing. 
He did. Okay? Yeah. And unfortunately, those are folks who we need to target. Right. As I said earlier, Barack Obama yeah. mobilized people who hadn't voted in decades. Got youth and teenagers to get involved in politics. You know what I mean? And uh, people of all income and all races and right. gender, he was right. able to mobilize. Yeah, right, right. That's a difficult task. That, that you know that he's a man of God that I've able to do that. So when you're on the local level, it's still the same when you got folks who don't want to vote, folks who don't believe in government, folks right. who don't trust politicians. You know what I mean? And so what you have to do is you always are campaigning, you always, every day of your life, if this is truly your calling to run for office and change your community, right. you always have to be doing something in your community to prove to, them, to prove to people that government is good, I'm a good person to help government be better for you, to respond to your needs, whether you need government assistance, whether you need housing, whether you want to improve the roads, whether you want need health insurance, whatever it is, you know, you you have to embody that in politics. And so, as I said this morning, I want everybody to leave here with a commitment to be engaged in politics. Because it's a big difference. And my, I always say this quote, charity is not justice. Yeah. I'm always a support, I'm always a support of, of course, faith-based community, nonprofit organizations, helping the poor and needy, you know what I mean, um, food drives, clothing drives. But I also adopt the philosophy that if we had good politicians, if we had good people in office, a lot of the problems that's in our community would be eliminated. The church wouldn't have to pay light bills for people if, if we could have elected officials that believe in funding the energy assistance program. The government has a program called energy assistance. It's to help people pay their light bills that are poor and who, who need help. It also has a program, La like is a program that if you live in an old shack and your energy bill is high because you got holes in the roof and holes in the floor, there's a government program that can help repair those so that your energy bill won't be so high. So in other words, government is there to work for people. Right. It's just that it, it's not working for everybody. And so we have to elect people to go into office to ensure that government is working for everybody, not just a few. Because most of the time, the people who need government the most are not voting, they're right. not active. Right. So okay, the people who need health insurance the most aren't voting. They don't know about Obamacare, right. you know, and they, you know what I mean, you know. So we have to engage those people to become active. And so basically, everybody I've talked to today and this morning, I'm encouraging them to find an issue and support or oppose that issue. Be it education, healthcare, public transportation, whatever it is, right. stand for something. Right. Also, we have to do more than just vote. I know every year around the election <laughs> time, we do voter registration drives. Well, let's have voter registration drives every month right. throughout the year, right. okay? Because they got more than just the presidential election, they got city council election, they got judges running for office. Right. All those folks matter in politics. So don't just go vote for the president, go vote for the city council member, go vote for the judge, judges, go vote right. throughout the year. And so we have to keep people engaged in politics, not just, oh, David Duke running for office, so let's all go run and vote. No, we should be voting and engaging and speaking at the city council meetings and going down to the legislature and marching and boycotting and doing all these things on a regular basis. And if you teach, if, if we train ourselves to do it on a regular basis, you don't have to worry about us not knowing or trying to mobilize us at the last minute to go do something. You already know, send that email out, post it on Facebook. Right. You know, you know, I'm gonna text 50 of my friends right now yeah. and they're they they ready to work, yeah. you know? Like you ran for office already, so you are ahead of the ball game with your campaign staff, your slogan. So you're much better prepared now because you did it one time. Right. So you gotta figure out a way to keep people engaged once, twice, three times in politics. That way they won't get lazy or won't, you know, they'll understand the value. Right. And so we have a huge problem with voter apathy, with people just not wanting to get involved in politics. They don't trust politicians, they don't go vote, they don't want to go to a rally. You definitely not gonna find nobody boycotting. Take for instance. You know, the Trayvon Martin situation. Right. Stevie Wonder, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson all said, everybody let's boycott Florida for, for their bad stand your ground law. I got four friends vacationing in Florida right now, okay? So I'm not saying that they shouldn't have the right to choose where they go on vacation. Right. Right. But if we really about ending, you know, the stand your ground law, if we really about ensuring that no more Trayvon Martin happens, what are you willing to sacrifice? And that's and, and so what we have to really get to people and in, in, in government and when you run for office, hit people where 
it impacts them. Health, you know, you know, food, a mother whose child has died, that's the, got killed in violence. That's the mother you want to be on your campaign against violence, your campaign against crime. You gotta go and find a way to touch people to motivate them because otherwise, if it ain't, I got a job, I got health insurance, I ain't gonna worry about doing nothing with that. And unfortunately, that's not the route to go. Even though I got health insurance, I'm still out there fighting for health care for people. Because right. I got health insurance. But they got people that they don't. And they deserve to have it. And so what you have to do is we have to figure out, we have to utilize strategies to keep people involved in politics, to take them to the city council, take them to the school board, take them to the legislature, and let them speak, and let them talk, and re talk them write letters. And let me tell you, Twitter and Facebook, you know, that's a great, that's a great place to, to be politically engaged. I, every day I post comments on Facebook about the politics, about issues. That's what young folks have to do. So we have to figure out a way and be innovative in getting people involved in politics. And that's what we're gonna do for you over the next three years to get you in the office yes, for city council, okay? Yes, sir. Um, you know, every small business wants contracts. Right. City governments and state government get all kinds of contracts. So go out there and mobilize those small businesses and have a focus group or have a town meeting or a community meeting on how to have small businesses get contracts. Right. You know, because all and then we collect those small business people, people in the room and talk about strategies that you want to go about to ensure that the city and the state help small businesses. You know, yes. we have to figure out a way to mobilize people around issues. And right. the way you do it is you got to find what issues matter to them most in their life. Otherwise, they're not going to, you know, if, if you were to announce that they're going to end child care assistance, right. a lot of mothers would be mad because they need it. Right. But what mothers don't understand, but we don't, what, we want, what we want though, we don't want mothers and fathers to, to only support child care assistance when the government talking about eliminating. Right. We want them up there every year talking about the value of child care assistance. Right. You know what I mean? Proactive. That's the way you do it because if you, if, if you wait until the government program been cut, or you wait until all the money's gone, and then you want to say, wait, what about my business? I need a contract. It's too late. You got to be already involved and say, look, when we cut this pie to eat, make sure I get my fair share. You can't wait till the pie's already eat, you know? And so being proactive in politics and political engagement is really the best strategy. And if you do that, more people will be mobilized, more people will benefit, and let me tell you, it'll make you a better candidate for office. Because the small business people are going to say, yeah, he had a town hall meeting in the community and to help small businesses, and I end up getting a contract out of that. Or the mother's going to say, oh, yeah, and I end up getting child care assistance, or I end up getting health insurance because that person advocated and stood up for me. And so, and that's the strategy you, got, you have to have around it. I think that one of the things that I see from a statewide level is that uh, a lack of information. We have individuals that are looking to start and sustain businesses that don't take the time to understand the environment. Uh, the environment is always changing and we have to make sure that we take advantage of all the resources that are out there to assist us with it. Let me give you a, a, a for instance. We often hear folks talk about uh, the need for a, uh, some sort of a website. I need to develop a website. Well, what we're starting to find out, we're starting to find out that we need to put more emphasis on uh, digital literacy as, the, as opposed to websites, because you can have a website, and if you don't get any hits, or if you don't understand social media, then it makes no sense. To have, it's a false sense of I'm doing something. So what we want to do now at the state level, we're starting to say, well, wait a minute, let's, let's back up. Let's stop with the tools and let's start with the philosophy. Let's understand the, uh, the knowledge behind what is going on because uh, the, the unfortunate thing that I see that's, that's happening here is that we have a lot of folks that are in business I don't know how to run a business. We have a lot of small business folks that we need to figure out how to move folks from small business to entrepreneurship. And what I mean by that is that small business is about uh, sustaining 
a ma and pa uh, entity, but it does not add value to the community. What we need to do is support and try to encourage uh, business development whereby we are exporting goods and services outside of our community, importing value, thereby creating what we call real net new economic development. And that's part of what we, we, we want to, and that's part of why I'm here this morning. Okay, uh, let, let me jump in and ask you a question. Because it's, it's great, you know, how we could keep in the community. So give us one, one thing, like one point of how we can do Okay, I, I can tell you. How I can make my business relevant to the community and make it be economic. Well, for instance, digital okay. media. Something that uh, if you are in the area of digital media, you can export and you're selling something, a good, a service outside your community. Uh, we could talk about a number of sectors whereby the uh, we could even talk about export. That that's something that uh, that we we see that we want to move toward. There are a number of life science. I mean, we could go on and on and on about non-traditional. Uh, sectors that can create that lifeline to create job opportunities for our community. And, and I don't want to diminish uh, the small businesses, but what I am saying to you is that if we just spread the same dollar from one corner to another corner, we have not created anything. And I'm suggesting that in order to create a positive, robust, economic environment, we have to figure out how to take something, good or service, take it outside of the community, bring in the dollars, and that is what is called that new economic development. I'm going to um, let Mr. White chime in here because he hit on a point with the digital piece. Um, and so we understand that we're in a new age, and so now the digital piece and uh, social media and technology changes the game when it comes to farming a business. One thing that you said was that now that we're in this new age, social media and technology can make it appear that we're prospering and doing successful in business when we're really doing nothing because we don't have the foundation and the principles. So I'm going to let uh, Mr. White, who is that the chime in, then we're going to come to you, Dr. Moore. That's an optimal. We, we, we may have some positive factors, but it may be less than optimal if we don't take advantage of it. And those of you seeing me type, I'm not texting somebody. Uh, these, are, these are notes I'm taking from these guys. So uh, I'm, I'm learning from, the, from my fellow panelists, but that's what you see me taking notes. Uh, real quickly on how you get people to work, uh, I wanted to touch on that is. I think one of the things you do, especially in a smaller, small organization, don't be afraid to ask your employees what are their dreams. Okay, if you can help them accomplish their dreams, they're going to give you what you want. If you give them what they need, they will give you what you want. Because sometimes they're only with you for a season. So don't be afraid of helping them get through that season. As we move towards the digital age, I think you need to write this down here. Marketing is about me, sales is about my customer or my client. Okay, marketing is about you, your business. That's a chance for you to brag and say what you do and communicate to the marketplace. Once a person walks in your door, marketing has done its job. It's no longer about you. It's about that client finding out their needs and determining how you can satisfy it better than no one else in the world. And if you do that, they're gonna find their last dollar to come back to you again and again and again. Now every time they walk through the door, you gotta redo it again, because their needs may have changed. How do you find those needs? You find out needs by the quality of the questions that you ask. And the real answer to any problem is typically three to four questions deep. So those are some things. It all depends on the situation, but one of the things that you always ask is, is you know, if you're planning out, take it back to social media. You know, if I'm sitting down with a client is, is what do you want to achieve with 
your Facebook or your Twitter account. Oh, I want to get more information out there. Okay, so you're saying you just want to be seen. You don't want to sell anything. Well, no, I do want to sell. Now, we're not, you can't sell on social media. And that's a whole different conversation. But you have to tailor your information on well, leading to that. Yes. You, okay, I'll unpack that. If you take your most successful companies that have had successful internet campaigns, they use social media to add value to build advocacy. Okay? You know, YouTube videos, the Facebook posts, hey, like this and you receive this. They didn't sell you, they're just marketing and bragging about how well, how good we are <laughs> so that you can come into Starbucks try it, download the free tune. They're not selling you. The best ones are. Now, when someone comes and said, hey, in the first Facebook post or the second Facebook post or the first communication they have and said, hey, I need a credit card, you run from it. Think about it. You run from it. It's no different than the first time I reach out to you on social media, I'm asking you to buy something. So the question you should ask yourself is what value can I bring to my marketplace? By bringing value, you start to develop the relationship. It's, it's up to you to own the relationship, not to them. So I think that's uh, you know that's how we we'll break that down. You don't sell, you communicate, you market and communicate. What we teach at the center is that social media is like a dinner party or a party with friends. And no one wants to go to a party and have someone try to sell them something at a party. It's, it's a conversation. It's a time to engage. It's a time to make friends, add value. And then when someone gets to know you and what you do, then it points and opens the door. So think of that. If, if, if you would be uncomfortable going to a party and having someone walk up to you and go, boy, I saw your car. I said, you need a new car? <laughs> well, I slightly diff beg to differ because either I'm rude or I'm smart. <laughs> but, but social media, times at dinner, on the golf course, on the tennis court, I saw a gentleman this morning and uh, he said, look, you haven't been at the Y lately. And I was like, yeah, because I'm out in the suburb, I'm out in the country, so I join anytime. But I've sold so many radio shows at the Y in the steam room. <laughs> it's steady. I've sold so many people at a restaurant. Listen, you can incorporate some of you with small businesses, beauty shops, restaurants, got your own book. Listen, you better take these advantages up. Social media, every time you meet a person, meet a person. If you ain't win Dixit, I'll sneak a cell over that bag in a minute. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen to me. When you got your money involved, you're a small business. When you talk about magnanimous, you're talking about, well, like marketing, exporting, that's fine. But when you look at business, it's usually the things like word of mouth, referral. Listen at this carefully. Yard by yard, everything seems hard. I'm going to do this. What am I going to this market? You have to pinpoint your market segmentation, strategize. Inch by inch, everything is a cinch. <laughs> giving somebody a number, giving somebody a card, saying this to someone. The little things, people, mean a lot. If your money's involved, it's your business, you best learn how to do the little things. Fill out a card, pass a person your card, say something to them. Never let an opportunity pass you to, to uh, inform them about your business, your product, or your service. And I'm just saying, the little things, the small business people, they mean a lot for not just establishing your name, but recurring service, and also letting people know that your brand 
is still firm and you still got a good service and keep placing them first. All right, so they held up the five minutes out about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but the mission is possible, right? All right, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors. Uh, my name is uh, Wilbert Lewis. I'm the CEO of Lifehouse Life Consultant. This is my beautiful wife, Vincent Lewis. She works with me. She's the brains of the operation. Actually, <laughs> we, we conduct our presentations. We, we do this in uh, both English and Spanish. So um, we try to touch all communities that we can actually reach. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit special. She may do it in Italian or something. So it's just a little special. But um, what we're talking about this afternoon is um, team building. Team building, um, let me back up a little bit. Team building and uh, leadership and organization change management. We are organizational uh, management consultants, uh, change consultants. For instance, your organization, if you want to go through change, if your organization wants, wants to grow, uh, has some sort of team building initiatives, we will go in and actually work with the leaders of that organization and the members of that organization down to the cellular level to actually uh, um, show you how to facilitate change. Now, anytime you mention change, and people are always like, oh my God, we're doing something different again, <laughs> we're doing something different again. But, but change has to happen. In all organizations, change has to happen. No matter what, you have to change. Because in this hyper-competitive market, they're, they're constantly improving things. Things are constantly getting better. They're, they're constantly making it faster, you know, making it a lot faster. First, like we talked about in the uh, main session there, uh, in the panel discussion, um, you know, we were writing letters before and actually picking up the phone and calling and, and, and going and talking to people and shaking hands and say, hey, how are you doing it? And sell your business. Now it's the uh, Facebook and the, uh, the, the Twitter and all the other things with, with the multimedia they have, it's, it's, it's a change, it's a huge change. And some get, um, kind of got lost in that, in that change, uh, that, that change cycle there. So, um, a little bit about us, we'll go a little bit further and we'll hopefully a few more people come before we get to the meat of the matter. Um, we have, together we have over 20 years of leadership experience. Over 20 years of leadership uh, experience through military organizations, church organizations, and uh, currently we're employed, besides what we do, we're employed with the uh, state's only organ procurement organization, and we're senior counselors for all the counselors and the, um, all the group counselors in the state of South Carolina. So we're actually nationally certified group counselors also, and of course, as we said before, person, uh, she's a per person, uh, professional interpreter. Um, let's see what else. Um, we work with the United States Navy uh, as, as the ambassador program, uh, with the United States Army in leadership and advisory to different uh, commanders uh, over in Korea and here in the United States of America. So that's a little bit about us. We kind of deep uh, jump into it and, and, and throughout the thing, if you have any questions, please, hey, got a question. I like to make things kind of informal so we can talk and really, you know, get to understand everything we're talking about, not just the classroom setting, although you'll see me writing on the board and drawing uh, cartoon pictures and stuff like that. I won't be drawing cartoon pictures. That's the cartoon supposed to be like, okay, relax, all right. You know, but I, I, like to, I like to describe things and, and write on the board and, and kind of paint a picture of what I'm talking about. So let's jump into it. Organization structure is one of the most important elements required to obtain and maintain successful mission, mission accomplishment. Now, typically, organizational outlines derive from this mission. We, we, we have an organizational outline that's derived from the mission of the organization, okay? Uh, the purpose is detailed uh, sequential tasks to be accomplished for a success of the mission and, and the mission to go. Now, organization structure also refers to the way an organization um, activities are coordinated and controlled, okay? And uh, represents another level of the mission. This is something good for the uh, leaders, of course, to understand, and uh, the followers of the organization. You have to understand the organization structure. Who does what, okay? Uh, and any change initiative, anytime we're doing change, um, that, that's something that's also important. So because when you're doing the work breakdown structure, you have to understand who's gonna be, who's responsible for what task. Who's the person that's going to be, say, in your case, handling the wood? 
who was ordering the, uh, the concrete, all those things. You have to understand the uh, work, breakdown, work breakdown structure and the uh, organization structure. Now, one of the most, one of the most, and of course we all agree on this, I'm pretty sure we do, one of the most uh, important elements of an organization is human capital. Without people, you have no organization. Yes, you can have a bunch of machines doing the work, but you have to have someone to program it. You have computers uh, moving at light speed, but you have to have uh, uh, people doing it. Now, let, let's talk about two things. And the anatomy and the physiology, okay? The structure and the function of an organization. Now, let's look at anatomy. Is the physical stature, excuse me, the physical structure, uh, especially the internal sources, what, what, what makes it work. The physiology, um, the, the makeup of the physiology is the science behind that organization. So the anatomy and the physiology, it, it, it leads to that organization being alive. Okay? We, we're getting somewhere here. We're gonna go there. Now the importance of organizational survival, the importance of your organization survival, the, 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 the importance of it is your structure and your function. You have to have an understood, proper function, structure, and a good function. Now, that, that, that goes right back to the responsibility of the leader. The, the, the leader in that organization has to, has to understand, identify, support, guide, nurture, all team members and encouraging them, and excuse me, encouraging them to actually be a part of that, that structure, that, the function of that organization. The, one of the greatest accomplishments in life is not achieved by individuals alone, but proactive people pulling together for a common good. It, it's our mission in life to offer our gifts to benefit one another and create a mutual gain in the world. And that's called teamwork. This is one of the things that, that, that we emphasize, uh, emphasize on doing all our presentations is we work with companies. We have to have, they have to have proper teamwork. Without teamwork, these organizations will not, uh, they, they won't survive. You have people bickering with, with one another, people not, not really sold, uh, sold on the mission and not really, they haven't really brought into the, the process of things or the product. So without that teamwork, you, you have problems. One of the main things that we, one of our, our, our key points here, personal connection. And I'm pretty sure we've, we've all seen this. I'm pretty sure we've all seen this. We go places or go to uh, organizations and you have people that's just there, they're just doing the work. They're just there, they're just doing the work, they're just going day to day, okay, I'm here to collect my paycheck, it's Friday, show me the money, okay? There's a lot of uh, organizations that, and, and each, this, of course it starts with small organizations also, that has to really explore this realm of personal connection. What do I mean by that? When you have employees working for you, or your employee yourself, one of the main things you have to do is identify with yourself. Follow me. You have to know who you are, your characteristics, who you think you are, okay, in order to connect personally. Okay, that has to be the first step. It has to be personal connection. Let's do an assessment real quick. Real quick, how many of you think you know yourself? Okay. Now, is that is that is that something that are you being identified by something that someone else has told you? Your title, your ego, things you've heard about yourself over the years. Who has actually who's actually sat there and looked in the mirror and said, "Man, who are you?" Have you ever done that? Has anyone ever challenged themselves? We really look square it off and challenge yourself and say, who are you? What's your purpose? What's your mission? Once we get to that, 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 that part of assess, assess, assessment, assessing ourselves, 
We're on to something. Once we get to that part, we're on to something. Once you look at, uh, look in that mirror and say, hey, who are you? What's your purpose? Then you, then you can start establishing a, a, a personal connection. And organizational successfulness, the success of your organization starts with you. Not with the leader. Well, yeah, they have, they have, they have, they have things to play into that, but it starts with you. Why? Because that mission is going to be divvied down to, broken down to the very basic element yourself, human capital. You with me? Okay? So once we find out who, who we are, honestly, who are you? What's your purpose? What's your mission? Not, not what my cousin has said, and not my uncle, and not what the, uh, uh, the guy who signs the check. Really, who are you? And are you personally connected to that mission? Are you there for the check, or are you there for the mission of that organization? Those are good questions. It's a good, good place to start. Very good place to start. Any questions so far? I feel like I'm thinking about time and trying to go fast and, 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 and trying to Slow it down maybe listen to you Between both of us, we have seven kids, and sometimes periodically Ooh. one will come in and say, um, they're fussing about one job or about this or about that, and from the 12-year-old to the 30-year-old, I say, all I care is about you. How do you see what's going on? Tell me about you. So when we're talking about personal connection and you're complaining about others, look at yourself and say, uh, where do I stand? What's my purpose in this job? My 30-year-old would say, my mom has always said, whether I am cleaning something, whether I'm volunteering, you do 150%. You should let your light shine wherever you are. So uh, instead of griping and complaining, and I didn't mean to take Go over. Go ahead. Um, but it's like, ask yourself, what am I here? What What is my purpose in this organization, in this team, in this relationship, in this church, or whatever it is? You ask, you analyze yourself, and you go from there. How many of you are working with someone, a, a small company that um, is stagnant or wants to grow, you hope to help it to grow? And how many of you are comfortable in corporate America? Well, I, 15 years ago, at, I don't know, I can't do that part, then I'm telling you. So I'll just say 15 years ago. <laughs>
knew that I was instilling them value. I knew I was instilling them dignity. I knew I was instilling them honor. So it's not how big you are, whether you're small in, in, small in your home or you have a commercial location, it's still your responsibility to give more than what's expected. Give greater than what's expected. Whether you're working for yourself or someone else. If you're working for someone else and you are doing an adequate job, giving them what they told you to do, then you wonder how you got passed by for the promotion. But if you give a little bit more than what's expected, then you'll see that growth in yourself. One of the things that I, I want to talk about, particularly to those that are interested in running your own business, it's a tough proposition. It's not an easy street. It's, it's not an easy street because two weeks have come by and the check won't be in the mail. Sometimes a month will go by and the check may not be in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not that easy. But when you do that and you begin to work your passion you'll find that it's, it's going to happen. You have to stay the course. It's so easy to quit. It's so easy to, it's so easy to give up. It's so easy to stop. I am not going to hold a lot of doors before I have my first three children. But then less than two years later, me and 21 children knocked on and knocked down the door of a commercial location because I stayed the course. So I'm not, I want to share with you who I am and what I do but I also want to, I don't want you to leave without having what you need to grow you from where you are. That's what I'm here for. I'm here, I love growing you. I'm here to empower you. Currently, I, I started, as I said, with my daycare. My, my passion from the passion to daycare, and then I learned over the years that, you know what? It doesn't, you can't stop here. Oftentimes, uh, I was told, oh, you know, you have to continue to teach fitness you are such an awesome instructor, that is your calling. You should teach fitness. And I was good at it because I purpose to be good at anything I do. But that, that was not my calling. The storm came, washed away my daycare. And it was over. Hurricane Katrina took it all with him, with all with her. And then I decided, you know, my husband said, you know, you know you're really good at, um, you really did handle that, that sale of our home really well. You should be a real estate agent. Went to real estate school and I became a real estate agent. The first rookie agent to grow six figures consecutively, three years consecutively. So one would probably think, why have you need that? That's got to be your passion. You got to be good at that. No, it's just because I care about people. I care about people, and that's why. I care about Ninety ninety families and homes inside of three years. But my passion is growing like people. My passion is ensuring that you are the best you you can be. So from the Katrina, from real estate, after earning money, and that's when we talked about, uh, the speaker before I talked about how uh, making over money, when you're working your mission, you're not working. I, I don't work anymore. I, I don't work. I don't work. Oh, that absolutely love what I do. So I, I don't work. Is it easy? No.
talk a little bit today about a subject that we're going to learn to face in life. And hope you get a little synopsis out of this. It's called failure. Everybody say failure. 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 Now I've learned something that if you answer back and you say something, you retain more. If you can just say something back. A lot of times you hear people saying, come on, y'all don't hear me. They just not trying to preach. Mm. They're trying to get you, 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 you stimulated to yeah. get you to absorb what they're saying. Because I found out in any endeavor, if you just mm. Say something back, you absorb more when you answer it back because you're really what? Responding. Mm -hmm. And when you what they call when the person eh, they say get the first what responders. Mm -hmm. They want to get you to respond. Because if a person can get you to respond, that means what? You got life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What they check? Is he breathing? Uh, you see any signs? So what we when I say say something, I'm just trying to get you to respond. That's all. But listen, everybody say it with me one more time. Everybody say failure. Failure. This is a word you're not you're gonna learn not to fear. Because why a lot of people don't start their own business, why a lot of people don't start their own ministry, why a lot of people don't start write their own book like Karen did, they don't have their own Facebook page like Ginger had. Uh, a lot of times the 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 the, the constant there of failing, the fear of suppose I Open up a gift shop and nobody come want to help. Suppose I have a seminar and nobody come. Suppose I have a restaurant and nobody comes want my food. That's a fear of failing. Then that's a fear of what other people will think. You know, we all have relatives, cousins, aunties, uncles. I told you, Ralph, don't do that. We tried to tell you, you put too much in that. Why are you doing all that? You already got a job at Sears, baby. You know, they, they think if you do something uh, uh, that's not in the mindset of them. You know, a lot of people, what? They will aspire to do things, but they don't want you to do things past what? They yeah, aspire. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right? So it costs you keeping you in the what? Comfort zone. Yeah. So they, when you try to uh, do something beyond the realm of what they think, then they say, guess what? You're going too far. Mm. <laughs> What you doing right over there in uh, 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 Kenilworth? That's too rich for your blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was you doing over there? What made you want to do this? Mm -hmm. 
You already got a nice job. But your, your aspirations cannot be uh, smothered because you have a, a, you know, entertain failure. All right, I want to talk to you about one particular thing about failure. When you step out, people who do not want to step out or don't have the courage and nerve, they want to keep you what? Everybody say, in the boat. In the boat. Now, I'm going to take you to the passage of Scripture. You probably know this already. In the Gospel of Matthew, there was a time when there was a man named Peter, one of the disciples. And we all know Peter's background, right? Yeah. Peter was very responsive. Peter was aggressive by nature. Yeah. Peter was a person that was real assertive. Peter would not uh, take things quietly like other disciples. Peter was always what? Talking. He would speak out. Peter had a little temper, you know. Like, so you got to understand some things about you in life that everything doesn't have to be perfect for you to go forward. Everything doesn't have to be what? Everybody say perfect. 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 For you to go where? Forward. Oh. Now listen, Peter was uh, uh, in an encounter once with one of the soldiers dealing with Jesus, and Peter kind of lost his patience. I mean, some of us here before, we lost our patience before, right? You know, and, you know, uh, Peter just wasn't in a mood to be too di diplomatic, like shuffling on diplomacy. So he got a sword and he what? Slashed what? Everybody say, cut his ear off. Cut his ear off. Now, he say, cut his ear. He cut it. Everybody say, cut it off. Cut it you know, when you get the fight, somebody say, they cut, they, they cut your baby. No, he said, no, if that's something, he said, no, my ear off. <laughs> that's time to go to EMS, right? Well, they cut Peter's ear where? Off. Oh. Everybody say, off. Oh. We're loud on that. Say, cut it what? Off. Oh. Now, 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 Jesus looked at things and was like, you know, you probably think that God looked at somebody and said, okay, you won't be being used. <laughs> no, don't look at you to be the Pope ever. Because <laughs> you cut people here off. You won't be the pastor either. Because you, you know, you got a temple, bro. You won't be over the deacons either. No, Jesus didn't do that. He said, you know what? I like your spunk, Peter. Then one time I was at a you know, restaurant, Peter kind of got, you know, the attorney started to say a few words, went in the Bible. <laughs> Call some people and say, Oh Lord, can't believe you're a disciple cousin like that. But Jesus didn't didn't remove him, right? He uh, kind of looked at Peter and said, You know, I said, How you do? You got a problem with your temper, your mouth, a lot of stuff, right? So I'm trying to tell you now, but you can't let failure write your tombstone for you. Now, let me tell you something about failure. Failure has to become your teacher. Failure has to become your what? Teacher. I say failure has to become a little louder than you become your what? Teacher. You have to learn from failure. Failure needs to be your teacher, right, class? Yeah. Failure needs to learn to be your what? Teacher. teacher. Not your undertaker. Teacher. <laughs> uh, I say teacher. Teacher. Not, not your last rites. Mm -hmm. Teacher. You know what Jesus said? He said, Peter, Satan. Now the word Satan, S-A-T-A-N. He didn't, didn't say the devil, he didn't say Diablo, he didn't say uh, the evil one, he didn't say the cunning one. He said Satan. Does that really mean that word Satan in the original context means that this is something or someone between me and the plan of God? Yeah. Satan. Now, Satan could be, uh, you know, you know Jesus called some people to Satan now because they got between what him and his plan with God. They were, they were labeled as Satan. Uh, later, you remember that time when uh, Peter came to Jesus? He said, look, <coughs> you're going to be with us. He said, no, I'm not going to be with you. I've got to go away. And he said, no, you're going to be with us. You're not, oh, you're not going to leave us. And uh, he said, look, you know what? You're not acting like the disciple now. You're acting like what? Satan. He said, Satan, get what? Behind me. So in other words, he says, Peter, I'm going to put you in your proper perspective. Now you're Satan. And then he went on later to say, now wait a minute, Satan, uh, you get behind me. But then in the context of the cussing and cutting the ear off, he didn't lose hope. And guess one thing, guess what he did? Failure cannot be your undertaker. It must be your teacher. He taught a lesson from that. You know what he came back and said later? He said, now Peter, I'm going to tell you something. Satan, the same one I just called you, he has desired to sift you as what? Me. You know, sift, when you say a sifter, I does. It thins the stuff out. Yeah. Sift you. You know, some of y'all from the country, you've seen the sifter work, right? You know, my grandma said, I want to sift it fine as can't have. I want to get it fine. Can't have real life, right? 
He said, now Satan has desired to have you, to sift you as what we do. But guess what he's saying? I'm not going to let failure get between that. Just because you fail, hmm. let that be your lesson. I'm not going to make it your undertaker. I'm not going to stamp on you, you're a cusser. I'm not going to stamp on you, you're violent. He says, Satan has desired to have you, to take your dreams, your goals, your business, everything. He's desired to have you and sift you as we. But I've already, what, interceded, prayed for you. That your what? That your what? Faith. Everybody say it loud. That your what? Faith. He said, baby, let me tell you, if you got faith, you can get through, cousin. If you got some faith, you can get past that temple. Come if you get some faith, I'm telling you, you can move a mountain. If you get some faith, you can move your business. You can get past the shortcoming. You can get past the bad loan. You can get past the bad overhead. You can get past this bad weekend. He said, I can motivate you to get past that. But you got to keep the what? Faith.
the cook, the dishwasher, I was there everything for baby to cook. And so it didn't make sense to run up and down the road everywhere and anywhere. I needed to work my mind. And a larger consulting firm, like Phoenix Consulting Group, to handle clients all over because they had the money to do that. They had the capacity to do that. I don't know the hand did not. So I had to really look at my capacity. When people think of your brand, what do they think of? So tell me about your brand. Well, when people look at, okay, I'm about to buy services from you, I'm a business, or I'm going to buy services from you, what do they think of you as? Are you the first in a particular market? Are you um, the best price? My name is G. Denise Dupree, and I'm here on behalf of my father's company, Sanco Construction. I enjoyed myself a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, the conference was very, um, the speakers were very entertaining. They were able to hold the audience's attention, and also it gave me a lot of knowledge on things that I need to capitalize on. I attended all the business seminars that were held. Um, I attended one of the public service seminars that would help because within the construction business of course you want to make uh, an influence into the public sector as well for just contract jobs and things like that. Mission Possible was very informative for me. I'm planning on leaving my grandchildren and great-grandchildren a legacy starting their business age 26 to three years old. 21 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren.
it had a very positive impact on me, very educational, informative, and I enjoyed all the speakers. My name is Mel Robertson. I'm Vice President of South Louisiana Lending Operations with Axion Louisiana, and I was invited by the lovely Tyre Banks to be a part of this initiative. Uh, so glad that I was able to be here uh, to be one of the small business coaches, if you will, uh, to be able to share some of the things in which we're doing and also uh, see some of my peers uh, within the industries that would have you and see some of these dots connect. It helped to create some visibility. Uh, the audience was receptive in that, you know, they are certainly trying to secure the access to capital. Uh, so we were showing them the money, if you will. Uh, it's always good to help a dream become a reality. Yes, uh, I was, uh, certainly in terms of some partnering and future collaborations. Uh, I'm actually going to be meeting with uh, one of the uh, persons that spoke today for lunch on next week for a business meeting. We're going to see how we can actually cross-connect and continue to empower entrepreneurs. Hi, I'm speaker and life coach Marvin Anderson, and uh, I'm here at Mission Possible. Awesome. And how was this experience for you today? This experience was incredible. It was dynamic. Uh, it, it's just a platform and a launching pad to where I know um, what the future holds for me. And so I'm just excited to be here, excited to be a part of what Banks Consulting has put together and what uh, the representatives of the state senators and the councilwoman, councilwomen supported her in doing. It's just been an amazing, amazing day, uh, just amazing. Uh, what was unique about this experience, I believe, is that it um, it offered um, such a diversity. It was a diversified audience. It was uh, it offered diversity in the fact that it co it covered public service. It covered the ministry aspect. It covered um, the business aspect. And so I think what was unique is that oftentimes we have conferences that are tailor made to one specific. Um, group or one specific sect. But today we covered many spectrums, many dynamics, and we got a little bit of everything to accomplish the mission because it's possible. It has been a totally awesome experience. We have had calls up until four o'clock at closing time asking, am I too late? Can I still come? Am I too late? So we will be putting this on again next year. Hopefully we'll do a two day session next year because we have so many people interested. This has been very awesome. I've had the wonderful opportunity to sit in on a lot of the sessions as well. It was awesome, very, very good experience. I recommend it to any business owner, budding entrepreneur, nonprofit, anyone in Baton Rouge to come out to the Mission Possible Conference. I am so super excited about the Mission Possible Leadership Conference 2013. I want to take a moment just to thank our sponsors who generously donated so that we could provide this free community resource. Louisiana Economic Development, Full Circle Communications, Just Right Aaron Service, Silver Bee Designs, Louisiana Small Business Development Center at Southern University, Extra Hands Virtual Assistant Service, Amerigroup Real Solutions in Healthcare, 1550 AM WPFC, Turner Industries, Banks Consulting, and Axion. Thank you.